There is a verse in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that says women should keep silent in church. They are not allowed to ask any questions. And if they want to learn something, they need to go home and ask their husbands. So what exactly does this mean? As a matter of fact, a few years ago, prominent pastor John MacArthur, when asked about Beth Moore, he said this. Okay, go home. <laughs> well, I, I see we're warmed up. <laughs> I dilly dally. There's no case that can be made biblically for a woman preacher, period, paragraph, end of discussion. So what exactly is a woman's place in the church? Are we to take this verse literally that women are not allowed to speak at all? They're not allowed to ask any questions in the church. Was this a cultural thing? What exactly did Paul have in mind here? We're going to get into that in this video coming up. Hey, my friend, welcome back to another video inside of our series, Church Gone Wild, a modern day look at the wildest church ever. And if you missed any videos in this series, there is a link in the description to the entire playlist. So I encourage you to get caught up. Now, let's jump into our content. Now, we're going to get to the controversial verse about women being silent a little bit later on in this video. But before we do, we've got some other verses that we need to address. Now, before we jump into this, it is really, really helpful helpful to understand the culture in which Paul was speaking. How were church services being conducted in this time period? Well, they're actually very, very different in those times as compared to how we do church in 2022. And the book of Acts gives us a little bit of insight as to how a traditional house church service was conducted. In Acts 2, verse 42, it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And so if we break those four things down, in any typical house church service, there was at least four components of that particular service. Number one, there was some teaching involved. And by the way, it wasn't like today where only the pastor was teaching. This was a community type of thing. So anyone in that church was permitted to offer what they believe was a teaching from the Lord. And so you had a teaching component and then you had a fellowship component. And this might have been where prophecy was going forth and people were sharing. Maybe people were speaking in tongues at this particular time. And so there was a fellowship portion of that particular service. And then you had a time whenever they would break bread and share a meal as they commemorated the Lord's uh, death, burial and resurrection. Uh, i.e. the Lord's Supper. And so there was a period of time there. And then finally, there was a time of prayer where they would come together and pray. So it was very, very different in this time how they did church compared to the way we do it today. And now this brings us to verse 26 in chapter 14. And Paul obviously allows for a variety of expressions of the move of the Holy Spirit. But what we have to remember is that this openness to the spirit should never be used as a pretext for disorder in the church service. Notice what he says. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, notice all the different things that he says. These are acceptable. One will sing. See, notice it says one. So it's not just a worship leader and they're the only one singing. No, I could lead out in singing. You could lead out in singing. Somebody else may have a song. It was just very, very open. Another will teach. See, not just a pastor. Somebody else could teach. Another will tell some special revelation God has given. And then one will speak in tongues and another will interpret what is said. So do you see how church was different in those times? Everybody was kind of involved and had some sort of role and there was freedom for anyone to share what they believe God put on their heart. But here's the key, he says, everything that is done must strengthen all of you. It has to be done to edify the church. Now Paul lays down the ground rules for speaking in tongues to ensure that everything that was done in church was done in decency and in order. And he lays down five ground rules. 
first is that anyone is open to speaking in tongues. We saw that. But then he says no more than two or three should speak in tongues. So there you go, right? It's not the situation where the pastor says, oh, okay, I want everybody in this place to speak in their prayer language. The Bible clearly says that is not what's supposed to be done. He says at most in any church service, two or three or three should be speaking in tongues. And then the next condition, he says they must speak one at a time. So there, there's no example in scripture of multiple people in a church service speaking in tongues or praying in tongues at the same time. That is totally unscriptural, totally unbiblical, and there's no type of biblical basis for that whatsoever. He says they have to take turns, right? And then someone must interpret. So there's no example in scripture of people speaking in tongues without interpretation. Must interpret what they say. And then it says, but if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. In other words, they should do it so, 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 so quietly that literally nobody can hear them. It's almost like praying from your heart to God. Then Paul lays down the ground rules for prophecy. And he says, once again, let two or three people prophesy. So once again, he says, hey, feel free. You can prophesy. You can prophesy, kind of spread it around. And then let the others evaluate what is said. So do you see the pattern here? If there's tongues that is being presented or or somebody speaking in tongues, how do you make sure that that is done at the edification of other people? It has to be an interpreter, and then it'll edit people or edify people. Well, how do you make sure that the prophecies that people are presenting are going to edify people? Well, you have to make sure that the other people there are evaluating what is being said to ensure that these prophecies are biblical, they are sound, they are consistent with uh, theology, and so that's why he says. Others need to be there to evaluate what they said. And then it says, but if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. So once again, this is the idea that, hey, if I'm if I'm speaking and I got a prophecy from God, but God shows somebody else something, then I have to acquiesce. I have to submit. I have to stop my prophecy to give room for someone else to prophesy. In this way, All who prophesy will have a turn to speak, right? This is a community, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Then one of my favorite verses, it says, remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit. Now, let me say what he's trying to say. Sometimes people will suggest that whenever they're in some sort of high spiritual moment, that they're carried away by the spirit and that something take took over them and they just couldn't control themselves. And, oh, man, I got slain in the spirit or, hey, I was speaking in tongues. And I just couldn't stop or I was dancing and I elbowed somebody or whatever it was or I was prophesying in church and, and I just the spirit just took over me in such a way that I just was out of control. No, stop. All right. The Bible does not teach that at all. It says people who prophesy are in control of their spirit, meaning they can never say that they were taken or carried away or they were not responsible for their actions or they couldn't stop because the previous verse says that if somebody's prophesying and somebody else has a prophecy, you need to stop. Right. So he says that for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the meetings of God's holy people. There's no such thing as disorder in the body of Christ in the church. Now we go into the danger zone. Do not enter. Do not enter because we come to this verse about women being silent in church. Now let's just read it and see what it says. And if we just read it for face value, it sounds like Paul is laying down a rule for all women of all time. But let's just see. He says, women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. Now, there have been many a man and many a pastor that has used this verse to oppress and suppress women. And they basically have interpreted this to suggest that Paul is laying down a rule throughout all history for all women And that women just need to be silent. They are better seen and not heard. And therefore, you know what? They're not allowed to even ask questions in the church based on this one verse. 
But I would suggest that is an improper interpretation of this for the following reasons. Reason number one is that why exclude women and not men as if men can't be divisive in church too? So if indeed it was a cultural problem where women were dividing and women were causing problems in the church, then why would Paul just exclude women and not deal with it from a men's perspective as well and say, hey, brothers, if you're out of order and you're causing disunity, then you all need to stop as well. But the second problem is that it contradicts Paul's previous allowance of women to prophesy in the church. He says in chapter 11, verse 5, but a woman dishonors her head if she hear what? Praise or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. So Paul clearly allows it just a few chapters earlier for men and women, specifically women in this verse, to pray and prophesy. That means they are not to be silent in church. That means their voices should be heard in church. But then the third problem is this. It contradicts the verse that we just read in the context in verse 31, just a few verses before. It says, in this way, all who prophesy, all who prophesy, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Notice this verse does not say only the men can prophesy. It doesn't say that, right? It suggests that anyone who was present at that church has the availability or the the option, if you will, to prophesy. But not only that, it also contradicts Joel's prophecy, which was reaffirmed in Acts chapter 2, verse 18, which says this, In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Let me read that again. Men and women alike, and they will prophesy. So anybody who interprets this verse and says, well, women need to be silent. They're not to be heard. They need to ask questions at home. How do you justify that interpretation without contradicting what other scriptures who clearly clearly teach that men and women are able to prophesy. But not only that, what if the woman was not married? Where would she go to ask her questions if she couldn't ask it in the church? It says, hey, women need to be silent in all the churches. And if you have a question, well, go ask your husband at home. Well, what if, what if I don't have a husband and I have a question? Where do I go if I can't ask it at church and I need to be silent and I don't have a husband at home to ask, then what am I supposed to do? But not only that, <laughs> Here's another problem. What if the woman was married, but her husband is unqualified to answer her question because she is more spiritually mature than him? So how is that going to help me? I have a question that I'm not allowed to ask at church, but then my husband is not qualified to answer it at home. So who's going to answer my question? You see, that's why you have to be careful, not just taking one verse out of context, but we have to make sure that we're properly discerning what that text is actually saying. So this is what I personally believe that this verse means, and I want to make sure I capture it very well, so I want you to read this along with me. I believe there were certain women in Corinth who may have been questioning their husbands in the middle of the service. Maybe they were even disagreeing with his prophecies or shaming him because he got something wrong. And the overall message that was being sent was that she was further along than him and that she was the spiritual leader of the home. To curtail this, Paul was instructing these women, not all women, these women to remain silent when they may have had a question or wanted to say something that may contradict what their husbands were saying publicly. They were to reserve their questions or their disagreement for the privacy of their own homes, because as the scriptures says, to do so in public would be shameful. So I believe that Paul was dealing with a very specific cultural thing where maybe there's some women there and they were disrespecting, disagreeing publicly with their husbands. And this was creating a picture that they were in control. They were in charge and it was violating the order that was supposed to be going on in the home where the husband's supposed to be submitted to God, the woman's supposed to be submitted to her husband, so on and so forth. And Paul wanted to put a stop to that because it was bringing shame and reproach to these particular men in the congregation. That's the way I see it based on how I interpret the scriptures. Now, the final couple of verses in this chapter, as we bring this whole chapter on tongues and prophecy to a close, he basically summarizes what he was trying to say throughout the entire chapter. He says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. 
So notice he's, he's, he's saying, hey, this is good. You should be eager to prophesy. And he also says, don't forbid speaking in tongues. He says it right here. He said, don't forbid it, but just be sure that everything is done properly and in order. And I think that verse really sums up well the whole point of this chapter. Look, prophecy is something that can be done in church, assuming that it's not done in a way that's not you know, biblically sound, and you don't just have disorder going on. When I say prophecy, I'm not just talking about predictive. I'm talking about encouraging. I'm talking about sharing with people in the word of God. I'm talking about strengthening people with the word of God. And then also tongues. He said, don't forbid it. So if somebody speaks in tongues in your church, don't shut them down and stop. I would say, wait for an interpretation. And if no interpretation is present, then you have to use that as a teachable moment to teach your congregation and also teach this person that they were out of order. Because if there's no interpretation present, that must mean that the tongues that they offered were out of line. Because if it were in line, if the Spirit was truly leading them to speak in tongues in that church service, there would have been someone there to interpret that tongue so that everyone can be edified. And so I believe that that is really the point that Paul is trying to drive home here. Now, if you want to learn more about women's role in ministry and whether women can be pastors or even co-pastors of churches, I want you to click this video right here on the screen. I'll also put a link in the description box below. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.